Good evening, everybody. I'm Kathy Van Ness. It's Friday night, and this is the Friday night conversation in our incredible speaker series. I am so pleased to have with me tonight Dr. Eager. In her story, I have goosebumps, and I haven't even told you her story yet. But I've seen her story, studied it, and I cannot wait for her to share it with you tonight. It's going to be quite special. Dr. Eager is a prolific author and member of several professional associations. She has a clinical practice in La Jolla, California, and holds a fac faculty appointment at the University of California, San Diego. She's appeared on numerous television programs, including Oprah Winfrey, and by the way, we just talked tonight about her TED Talk work, which is quite incredible. She was the primary subject of a Holocaust documentary that appeared on Dutch national television. She's frequently been invited to make speaking engagements, and she's here throughout the United States and Mexico. She spent a lot of time, which I think is one of the most amazing things, helping guys prepare from Desert Storm. In her own story of how she overcame her traumatic experiences, she was able to sort of talk to these and men coming off of those experiences and help, hopefully help them with their traumatic disorders. She's lectured for YPO. I happen to be a member. Oh, yes. Yes, a very big member, a long time since Precious I was a wee people. little girl, very special, and has helped guide people to help make peace with their past and turn life into a constant celebration. Doctor. Yes. When you sit here with us tonight, what do you see in your mind? What are the pages of your mind showing us tonight? I see love. That is the answer, and I see hope. That's amazing. That is the power. Mm -hmm. Do you remember as a child experiencing anti-Semitism? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I uh, actually went to a Jewish school, and when we came out, children were spitting at us. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just a little. Mm -hmm. Did you know what that meant? Did you understand that that was a against you as a child? Not really, not really. I, uh, I'm remembering how I was a very lonely child because I had two very talented sisters. One of them played the Mendelssohn violin concerto when she was five years old. That was a hard act to follow. Right. And um, the other one played the piano. So my parents, after two girls, they really wanted a son. And guess what? <laughs> they got me. <laughs> and I never introduced myself by my name. I would say, I'm Clara's sister. And today I tell children, you know, you're beautiful just the way you are. And don't let anybody identify you. Um, and. Uh, I think God works in a way that everything comes out perfect. I was cross-eyed, and my sisters, they sang a song that I'm so ugly that I'm never going to find a husband. That wasn't the problem. The problem was I believed it. And I was walking in the streets in Hungary, and uh, I didn't want you to be in shock of my ugly face. So I spent a lot of time alone. And I didn't realize that I developed some inner resources that no Nazi or anyone could take away. Wow. And this is what I'm teaching today, people, how not to try to control something. <laughs> that you can't. What was that changing is. about life? or your neighborhoods, your families, when the Nazis went to power? Were there things that you noticed that were specific changes? Well, my, uh, we lived on Main Street in Kasha, Hungary. And we were thrown out of there because the Hungarian Nazi party moved in. Yes, so. And that was your home? We felt it and we had to wear a yellow star. Oh my gosh. Yes. And people who spoke to me from one day to the next, they were not allowed. And did you know by wearing that that you were different? Was it, did you understand what they were, what was really going on? Yes, uh, the biggest shock for me was when I was a very talented gymnast. 
And my coach came to me one day that I, ha that I have to train another girl because I don't qualify because I'm Jewish. Oh, my gosh. To me, I, I practiced at least five hours a day. I would never sit in a chair, you know, I was doing the splits. My goodness. Yeah. Well, you know, your mother was quoted saying, no one can take away from you what you put into your own mind. That's right. How did these words help you? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, what happened in the kettle car. In the kettle car, my mom was a very insightful person with a lot of sick sense. And she hugged me and she said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here mm. in your own mind. That's so powerful. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. That's exactly what happened. So when you arrived, what happened? Then I never knew about Auschwitz. Everything happened very quickly. The Hungarians joined Hitler March 1944. And uh, in May, I was already in the kettle car. So everything was very, very, very shocking. Uh, Arbeit must fry, and, uh, and my father was separated right away. My sister Clara, it's really important to mention that uh, she was the only Jewish girl accepted at the music conservatory in Budapest. She was already in, in the camp, and her Christian professor smuggled her out mm -hmm. and hit her until the end of the war. I was fortunate enough to be invited uh, in New Zealand by Prime Minister Lange, who had this wonderful, wonderful conference for the people who wow. risked their lives to save others. He called them the righteous Gentiles. Wow, the righteous Gentiles. Well, you like Schindler. Yeah. When you were, th did you form friendships? Like Corrie Tim Boone, mm -hmm. I lectured with her myself at the, at the Baptist University. When you were there, were there, were, there, were there moments that you had friendships with the people that sort of helped you along? What gave you all of the incredible hope that got you through that time of your life? My curiosity. I differentiate between that. being childish or childlike. And that childlike part in me that's what did. I wanted to know what's going to happen next. And uh, I was 16 in Auschwitz. You were young. Yeah, yeah. I what was, was a young. day like at 16 years old, 16, not with your family, by yeah. yourself? What was that like? Well, you know, I was always a kind of a hopeless romantic. I had a boyfriend. And um, my mom looked at me when I was about 10 very seriously, and she said, I'm so glad that you have brains because you have no looks. Oh, my gosh. Oh my be, gosh. Be, be very careful the messages yeah. that we carry yeah. with us. Yeah. I'm mean, not here to blame my mom, but I became very erudite, and I spoke many languages, and I interpret uh, oh. the interpretation of dream is what I, what I read and discussed when I was 14. So, um, so it didn't hurt me any. Um, you see, happiness doesn't come from the outside. People who are waiting for somebody to make you happy are not going to be happy. Right. Many times women come to me and say, Edie, I gotta find a man. I say, if I were a man, I would run from you. <laughs> <laughs> but go back to that time. Yeah. Anyway. What was that like as that young you girl? You see what I'm doing now? I keep going away from mm -hmm. where you want me to mm -hmm. be. You see how, because there that's the hardest thing. Uh, you're good. You're very good. <laughs> you're very good. <laughs> We're a very good, very good interviewer. Um, Thank you. What was happening that a line was formed And I'm taking you there now, so put your seat belts on. 
Um, and it's clear to me, as it was today, that we came to the end of the line and there was Dr. Mengele, I didn't know who he was, who pointed to the left and pointed to the right. He pointed my mom to go to the left and my sister and I to the right. And he, here comes the absurdity of it all. I followed my mom and he came after me and grabbed me and looked me in the eye and said, you're going to see your mother very soon. She's just going to take a shower and promptly threw me on the other side, which meant life. But you didn't know about that, of course. I tell you, it took me at least 40 years. Mm -hmm. And not until I really decided to go back to Auschwitz, to go back to that lion's den and look at the lion in the field. I had tremendous guilt and shame on the top of it. I graduated with honors from the university and I never showed up for my graduation because I said to myself, I'm too old. So, wow. you know, I didn't need a Nazi out there. I had mm -hmm. one in me. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's wonderful that I was blessed to be able to go back to school. And uh, I'm not a shrink. No. I'm a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I help people to really look at themselves, and I, I am so blessed that I can be a guide. Yeah. I like movement because I'm a dancer. So. Was there, were there people that you got to know at camp? Absolutely. Your dear friends, and you, have you kept in touch with them? Uh, I did, yes, yes. Um, you know, I was one of the youngest. I was 16 yeah, in Auschwitz, and uh, just very few of us are left. Very yeah, good. Very and I think that's one of the magic of this conversation is to actually mm -hmm. be able to have your voice and have us be able to share this because you are yeah, the okay. last of something that is a very important thing to hear with the voice. Well, it's I'm very, very committed, very committed to do everything in my power. I'm very invested to the youth. Yeah, I want to be a good role model to them. Exactly. And to stay in, uh, stay in school. I'm going to ask you kind of a crazy question. Yes. You know which one I'm going to ask. There is sure. no crazy question. A you question once is a question. danced for Dr. Mengele, I understand. At the I age danced of for Dr. Mengele. You were only weighing 40 pounds. I don't know why that I don't know. Tiny. That's what, that's what they tell me. What but was that like, this man who well, just. Well, I, I was a mess. I was a mess. I ended up in a hospital. My teeth were separated from my gums. I had five kinds of typhoid fever. Mm. I could hardly breathe. I was filled with water. They were going to amputate my legs, but look at that. And what is interesting about that, that I became very suicidal. After all that was happening, because today I see many people who get up in the morning, they don't say what, they say what for. Mm -hmm. that there is no meaning, there is no purpose, there is nothing to get up for. And I realized my parents are not coming back, and reality hit me. And, uh, and I think God spoke to me and said, if you die now, you're going to be a coward. But if you live, wow. you're going to be for something. And you did. And I you did. thank God joined the healing arts profession. Yes, yes, absolutely. Do you remember, you know, what did you feel like when you were liberated? What did that feel like? Well, I was... It all unknown out there. I was liberated one of the last ones. I, I was out of Auschwitz uh, in December. I stood in line to get my tattoo, and I didn't. So I asked, how come? And I was told that they don't want to waste the ink on me and that I'm going to the gas chamber. Everything happened so quickly. My sister Magda ended up in this pile and I was in this pile and I knew we needed to be together. So I looked at the guard and I started to do some cartwheels to get his attention so Magda and I could be together. Wow. And we were out of Auschwitz. We became slave laborers. 
I carried ammunition. Oh my goodness. I worked in factories and I ended up in Mauthausen uh, and the Death March and I was liberated May 4, 1945 by the 71st Infantry. Oh my God, goosebumps, my goodness. Look how God works exactly. mysterious ways. Oh my gosh. I was called from Car Fort Carson in Colorado City. Okay, I get a call, Dr. Reedy Tiva Eager, I said yes. We heard about you, that you really know a lot about PTSD. Would you be so kind and come to Fort Carson to speak to the people who are coming back from Afghanistan? And I said, of course. And I show up and guess what? It's the home of the 71st oh Infantry. Oh my gosh. Huh? Karmic. Look how Completely things come karmic. around. Completely. Yeah. Were you, were you with your sisters? Were you pretty much with your sisters when you were liberated? Did you all go to the same place? Or? My sister Magda and I were together right. and Clara was saved okay. by her That's professor right. in Budapest. And the way I found out that she's alive, when I was coming from Vienna to Prague on the top of a train and they took us to a place and I saw big advertisements of my sister with her violin that she's oh giving a goodness. concert. And wow. that's how I found that she was alive. And you're very close to your sisters today. My s one of them died. One of them the one, died. The other one very close with. She became a violinist with the Sydney Symphony mm. in Sydney, Australia. Wow. wow. Yeah. So you once said, yes. this is something that I got from your bio, that I would still be a prisoner and a delayed victim of the Holocaust. So I never forget that I may not even overcome it, but I came to terms with it. And it's my cherished wound that really makes me a wounded healer today. You've said you suffered from survival guilt, but how have you overcome this? Or have you? I have yet to No, I'm still in the process of becoming. A, once I arrive, I'll be dead. <laughs> and I think that's, that's what keeps me young. You do your homework beautifully. <laughs> You're absolutely amazing. You, my God. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a wonderful overcome. Thing. I mean, you, let's face it, you able, overcame something that was monumental. At a small teenage girl, that they're on their iPhones and on their iPads, to try to imagine in today's world, this is why this is so important, to imagine in today's world what you had to go through to be here with us today. How did you do it? How did you find the strength? Faith. Faith. That's different from belief. Mm -hmm. People say, I believe, I believe, I believe. I say, I don't care what you believe, but I do care what kind of life you lead. Yes. Words can be very cheap commodities. I do the work, I will never retire. I go to Flint, Michigan, talking to the poor children and uh, in Budapest. Mm -hmm. uh, and my book is going to come out with Philip like Zimbardo uh, from Stanford, who is really pushing it. Wow. And, uh, Isn't that exciting? I mean, that's and like it's very nice, wow. very nice and that is happening. So um, I love to speak to women, and I hope we're going to have a nice girl talk, yeah. because age is uh, wonderful. Wonderful because I, I feel much younger now than I did 40 years ago. So and you know why? 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 Because I'm willing to let go of the need for approval. And I think that's why people come here to the Golden Door, not to recover, but to discover my true self yeah. that you gave up for a formula that is not working. That I become someone's daughter and someone's mother and someone's yeah. uh, uh, whatever, wife. But that's a role. That's but who very is the, yeah, my true self. And this is what I study in families. And this is what I ask women. Actually, two questions. One of them When did your childhood end? That's a good question. I became a sexologist. There is such a thing. 
because I was working with families and I went to my supervisor and um, my supervisor said, so how is it going with couples? And I said, well, they talk to me about sex, money, and in-laws, maybe not in that order. I said, so what's your trouble? I said, well, I was 17 when I met my husband. I'm married 20 odd years, I have three children, and I know nothing about sex. That's, oh what, it, that's what it is. So he sent me to Masters and Johnson. Oh my gosh. That was a long time ago. Oh my gosh. And so I became a diplomat in sexology. And I'm going to tell you that if you were sexually abused, you were far more in prison because I knew who was the enemy. Mm -hmm. I was told every day I'm never going to get out of here alive. But I learned that I didn't allow them to ever murder my spirit. That's pretty strong. They could throw me in the gas chamber any minute. And that's the difference between stress and distress. Stress is good. It's a salt of life, Aunt Sally has said. But distress is when you don't know what's going to happen next. Like when we took a shower, we never knew whether mm -hmm. water is going to come out or gas is going to come out. Mm -hmm. And you were just 17. I want to keep reminding you. were just a, Yeah, a when you don't know what's going to happen next. You know, share with us, if you can, a story that you haven't told your children or your grandchildren. Well, when I came to America, I came on a, on a ship called General House for displaced people. I married what you call up. You know, we used to tell. I married someone who I met in a TB hospital and because we were all shipwrecked and we wanted to be normal. Yeah. So you got married. You'll see many of the survivors got married very quickly and had children. So, so I get married and I uh, get pregnant and my uh, doctor tells me I have to have an abortion because I'm not strong enough to have a child. And he even comes over to the house, and I say to the man, sir, I choose life. And my late husband followed the doctor down, apologizing that his wife really doesn't know how to talk to a doctor. <laughs> you are, okay. Well, my little girl was a 10-pounder, and I could have had there a horse doctor. There you go. And today she, has a practice on Park oh, Avenue in New York. You. And she's married to Robert Engel, who's yeah. a Nobel Prize yeah, winner in economics. So story. get a second opinion, please. <laughs> I agree with that. That's America there you go. Is, is the country of second opinion. And after two girls, I had a beautiful son, but he didn't develop like the others. And I was told that he may not even ever make it to high school. So this is that what I bring really, that, that defiance, that way that you never really give up. Mm -hmm. So I asked, where do I get a second opinion? And I was told that Johns Hopkins. I'm taking my son to Johns Hopkins to a beautiful man, Dr. Um, Clark, a neurologist. And after a week, he sat me down and he said, mother, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm a student at the university in Texas. And he said, well, you know, this child is going to be what you make of him. And? And I was in shock. I didn't know. He said, your son looks retarded, but he's not. But he's going to need uh, this therapy and that therapy and um, cerebral palsy CP. I took my son home. I dropped out of school. My son, John, graduated as a top 10 student from the University of Texas. So this, this is what I bring you. Believe. You see, I don't Just want anyone believe. to feel sorry for me because I think all of us here, women, um, were taught, perhaps, not in your generation, but in mine, that, that if you didn't get married by the time you were 25, 
you were an old maid. Mm -hmm. So the goal was for a boy to become a somebody, but for a girl to find somebody. Right. Because you're nobody until somebody right. loves you. Right. Well, that's, like that. that's Hollywood. Yes, that's and right. so self-love is self-care. And that's why I ask, when did your childhood end? Wow, that's a big question. And so, if you were sexually abused, yeah. definitely. The other question I asked, what was that? Was you want to hear the yes, other that was it. Would you like to be married to you? Oh, I think that's a great question. Would you like to be married to you? I think, think that's about a great it. question. Are you fun to be around? I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I would say yes. I always say I'm a good catch. I go swing <laughs> dancing every Sunday. Exactly. I'm with you. Yes, yes. The music uh, is the big band. The music, her, I asked the question, what is your favorite music? And yeah. the answer was jazz. Jazz. Big band. Big yeah. band. That's all fun. And okay. you dance every week. Every Sunday, yes. Every Sunday. It's good for you. Good exercise. It's good exercise. Yeah. How do you I feel today? What's your attitude toward God and religion today? I think religion can be very good. It gives you order in life. But religiosity is another thing. And I unfortunately see today such painful, yeah. such painful yeah. things that are happening. And, yeah. and uh, it's very scary because they say they want to wave the flag on the White House, I know. the ISIS. And I hope, I certainly hope. Well, I want to jump to another place, to something that's about your, for your work now. Is what do you, tell me about forgiveness. How did you, with all that had happened in your life that was so incredible, how did you or did you get to forgiveness? You know, the word forgiveness is being many times very misunderstood uh, because uh, um, because they think that forgiveness means condoning and uh, forgetting. But actually, revenge gives you satisfaction. It's very temporary. Do you feel with all your success that that was revenge for you? I think my best revenge to Hitler that I have three children, five grandchildren, Isn't three great-grandsons. I have four generations. And that's that's my best revenge. That's amazing, though. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. So you did get your revenge I, um, in more ways than one. But I don't have time. I don't have time. Uh, I don't have time to really hold hate and anger in me because that saps on my spirituality. Right. right. So I'm very selective who's going to get my anger. <laughs> believe me, believe me. I think forgiveness is a gift that yeah. you give oneself. And I needed to go back to Auschwitz what was that to like? do that. I couldn't do that with a therapist and in a therapy so you room. you did that on your own? I did it on my own. I returned to Auschwitz. I had to go and, and go back to that lion's den and look at the lion in a You face. saw the rooms or the places that I you... Saw, I saw the barracks. I don't know if it was mm -hmm. that one. And uh, to me, that was the most positive thing. And that's the work I do, actually, uh, to, to, to uh, take your little hand and I will guide you to... Uh, to revisit the places where you've been, relive yeah. that experience, but, but you don't get to stay there. Yeah, you go through the valley of the shadow of that, but you don't, don't camp there and set up household there. So, so when so, you got there, you must have felt one way, and when you left, you must have felt another. What was the change? Uh, actually, as I was walking out, I came with my late husband, and I asked him not to come with me. I wanted to do that alone. But as I was coming out, a Polish soldier came. And for a moment, I thought I'm back in a camp. And the realization that I had a blue American passport in my pocket. Yes, 
but I had to feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, let to, me tell you. Yes. I spent three years at the university trying to get rid of my Hungarian accent. And when I came out of Auschwitz, I said, it's fine. I'm going to speak English with an accent. It's okay. I'm, I'm not trying to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy like I did and assimilate. Yeah. And I think I regained that power wow. that I am. I'm not Popeye. That right. means I can change right. from moment to moment. You know, people tell me that's not me. Well, who is, who is, the, who is the me? The me that I choose to be. So again, going back to forgiveness is, is, is something that is not you do one time, but many, many times. And I'm hoping that this beautiful place here is a time out, like in football, mm -hmm. to regroup, because there is no going back. There is a new beginning. Exactly. I worked at Mirabal uh, for 10 years. Um, we took 180 women with breast cancer, and it's amazing. It's amazing how, how the way people approached with the same symptomatology and same diagnosis, how they had this tremendous will to live because the doctors do the curing, but the healing right. is an inside job. Right. And did you, were you able to see that some person's ability to heal inwardly was different than another person's? Very much so. And how could you help? You were a unique, one of a kind. Well, some people are faster, some people are you know, slower. People ask me um, in a grief process mm -hmm. because it's grieving and feeling and healing and you cannot heal what you don't feel. And grief is not an illness. We use the word depression mm -hmm. so loosely. But I think most today, people are television. not depressed. They're suffering from unresolved grief. Yeah. And so there you, is no forgiveness without rage. Like just getting mad. Don't cover garlic with chocolate. It's a no. It, I like that. Yeah. But well, yeah. don't you find though today that depression is this huge bucket of every emotion you could possibly feel, feel and you're mm -hmm. just supposed to take something, a pill, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to make all those moments mm -hmm. go away. I mean, what, what, society has come to the point that that's just, is, that's not real. Well, you know, life is difficult. If you look at your birth certificate, it doesn't say life is easy. There is no guarantee. There is no guarantee for a marriage. There is no certainty. But there is probability. Mm. I think there is probability. And people who are indulged are really, unfortunately, don't make very good survivors because they want everything easy and they want it now. Yeah. They have very low frustration tolerance right. level. And you must have seen that a lot though now because not only in the people that you work with, with you've become a successful career of a, a career of a, a clinical psychologist mm -hmm. and you're using your experience to treat post-traumatic stress order. Mm -hmm. So how interesting is this? Like not only what was this like for you, you could have seen that stress from the days of being 17 years old. Who had the power to survive? And now you're applying that wisdom. What is that like? Mm -hmm. This wonderful It's the best years of my life. Tell me about I'm, that. I'm so happy. I'm so very happy. I, I'm the happiest now. And I'm at the evening time in my life. Every moment is precious. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to hate. Right. It doesn't mean I'm going to invite somebody for dinner, you right. know, um, like from the white supremacy group. Right. Uh, um, I, think, I think the more choices we have in life, the less likely we're going to be victims of anything. But have you found that your experiences helped 
people with that post-traumatic? Have you been able to see a dramatic change and a success in uh, turning them around? To, or did, is it, does it come naturally or do you teach it? Do you see the grain in there that you could pull out or can you just say, get your grain? You bring out such wonderful questions, the difference between teaching or learning. Right. Certain things, you know, you cannot really teach. It's uh, like meaning in life. It's a discovery. Right. I, I cannot buy it. Right. But I think uh, pain can give you that opportunity when you decide it's enough of that. But you see, you cannot be a victim without a victimizer. And while you blame, you're still a child. I don't care whether you're 30, 40, or 80. You need to get While that. you blame, you know, I'm angry because you did that and you did that, and you make me angry. No, you don't make me angry. Right. You don't have that power. In other words, it's, you know, do you find that frustrating when you see your patients sometimes mm -hmm. go back and say, oh, you know, my mother, my father, my That's brother, right. my sister? Right. I mean, like, when do you, do, do you want to just, what do you tell them? Like, I provide a place for everyone. I remember one hour a mother came in and her daughter was dying and we were crying and grieving and, and, um, and the next hour a woman comes in crying in the same tears because her yellow Cadillac just arrived and it's not the color oh that she chose. So you think I was going to shake her up and say, you should have been here an hour ago? Exactly. No. Exactly. No. Are you kidding? No, no, no. So what do you do? It, it was her grief. And I listen and I validate the feelings. And, uh, and, and I provide an atmosphere where people can feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. Mm -hmm, there is course. no right or wrong right. feeling. There is only my feeling. Right. You have a website. I do. I never look at anything. Turning broken bones into, into dancing. dancing. Yeah. A journey through life. Yeah, Why? Yeah, I think yeah. it's such a wonderful name. Turning broken journey, bones yeah. into dancing. Journey to freedom. I think it's that's why. Gonna Did you tell me about my this? title of the book? Uh, well, it is uh, recognizing that everything in life is an opportunity for an opportunity. Like I discovered many things in Auschwitz I never thought was possible. But you had to really move. Like? You know, like, like, you know, my sister Magda. She was heavy and I was skinny, but I was, I was very muscly. My, my father uh, stood there and I said, why don't you get in my, you know, beat me up and, and I would show him how strong I am. Uh, I think it was important in Auschwitz to be an observer and a participant, but not to allow them to really pull you in and become a victim. Yeah. I was victimized. You were not a victim. I'm not a victim. Do you think you'll ever retire? Ever retire? No, 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 no. I don't believe in retirement. I'm better now than I was many, I many years ago. Totally can appreciate I'm more that. real. I know. If I don't know, I tell you. You know, I don't try to impress and, and please everyone. And one of the things that hopefully that you will give up while you're here is perfectionism. Yeah, that's impossible. That's that can kill you. Yes. Why do people want to strive for perfection? Why is that? I hear that all the time. Because they were children who were not loved unconditionally. Mm. I love you if you make a good report card. I love you if you cut your hair. I love you if you don't marry such and such. That is really That's not love. Yeah. That's manipulation. Yeah, that is, that's, that's, that's a really important one. That's important. You know what this is my definition of love? What is your definition Give me of something love? here. Something you want to uh, uh, give me that give, give me a piece give of me back paper. my cards. <laughs> give me a card. <laughs> <I'll be lost. laughs>
My definition of love is the ability to let go. Oh, that's perfect. I agree with you about that. Not revenge. I, I, I didn't want to throw it that's at okay. you, but I usually <laughs> throw things. Uh, but I think that's really, you know, we hear that a lot so. about what is perfect, what is perfect, and it's impossible to be perfect. And I know I have my it's own children. It's inhuman. I would not ever. It's not human. It's not human. We, we are, are humans. Not perfect. We are fallible. We make mistakes. We are mistake. not perfect. We're not perfect at the golden door. We try to be perfect. So I hope you forgive yourself, Bonta, to say that when you have guilt, you are in the past. And that's the concentration camp of your own mind. If only I would have done that. If only, if only, if only. You're either in the past or you say, I won't be happy until. Wow. Until I graduate, until I find a man, until I retire. Because the only thing that I have control of is the present. I can only touch you now. And that's what keeps me young. Wow, that's yeah. pretty special. Hmm? So that almost, you almost did it perfectly for me. It's like we practiced. <laughs> Absolutely like we practiced. Really? I love you for that. Yeah, Are you yeah. optimistic about the future? I, I hope to, I hope to be a realist. I think when you see idealists and they don't get what they expecting, they can be very cynical. I, uh, but never stop dreaming because yeah. life without dreams is exactly. madness. Exactly. Yes. So we have all these wonderful guests with us tonight, and it Great. is such an honor to be with you. My last my question Anna. for you is, yes. what message can you leave my incredible guests with that they should remember this magical moment forever of sitting here with you tonight? What would be the message that you would like to leave with them with? Then we'll go to questions. That life is beautiful, is what you make of it. It's not what happens that everything in life is for you to discover many, many, many things, as I did. Oh my God, there's so many. And uh, self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. That's nice. I like that one. Mm -hmm. I thank you for having me. If I brought out some feelings in you, remember the opposite of depression is expression. So what comes out of your body will never make you ill. What stays in there does. So I hope that if you cry, you're going to feel better. Just have a good cry and you feel better. It's, it's good to have. But pay attention what your tear is saying. You know, our, our grandmothers didn't have the education we do. That's right. But they knew how to make a man feel like a man. Yep. that they didn't compete with a man. And I can tell you, if you give two compliments to your husband every day... He'll be a happy husband. Yes. <laughs> and you'll be a happy wife. Men like to be acknowledged. <laughs> and no criticism, no criticism, zero criticism. No criticism. <laughs> zero criticism. <laughs> you see, sometimes maybe mothers say something like, you know, sweetheart, you're such a pretty girl, but you're a little fat and a little pimply. <laughs> That's not good. Anytime you say but, you cancel everything right. you said before that right. but. So give me the but and I'll give you an and. Right. Yes, and yes. furthermore. And I pay a lot of attention how couples talk to each other. Yeah. Opposites attract, but they can drive each other nuts in oh marriage. Let me tell you. Oh my goodness. And, and I love to do work with couples I because bet. I study the be dynamics of week. the family. So I do my choreography. Oh my I'm God. still dancing. <laughs> so I want to just say thank you again for being here with us tonight. You're so welcome.